Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This he taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hello, Ryan. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Well, you know, a few weeks ago, I thought I was going to be asking this seat taken to people, you know, back out, no COVID, come back, you're vaccinated now, Delta, you know, I don't want anybody in this seat anymore. No, no, we're back to this seat is not available. Yeah, this seat is not available, you know, go to the next car. Yeah, I mean, you know, you did that before mostly too. But. Yeah, I mean, I've got a big germ thing pre COVID, a long history of being uncomfortable. Yeah, the tagline next- was always aspirational. It was never really like, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, today's episode actually a good topic because it's, it's outdoors related. We're still in a, a safe space. We're sending people out to the Appalachian Trail. The Appalachian Trail, uh, a, a place that we, we got to know, or I got to know at least uh, through little chunks of my, uh, you know, uh, COVID adventure. Well, and you, uh, I think you took three or four months off, right? And, and hiked the whole thing, right? Uh, it takes five to seven months, as oh, we'll okay. find. <laughs> I, I mean, I would do it that quickly. Though. I'd probably do it in three, you know? And what's your, uh, what's, what's the total mileage of the Appalachian Trail? It's over 2,000 miles. That's right, Ryan. It's 2,000. <laughs> it's it's 2,193 miles to be exact. And it, it, it covers 14 states. That's a lot of states. It's a lot. And the highest elevation that it reaches, could that be right? The highest elevation is 464, 500 feet. I don't know. I wouldn't say that. I'm not a big elevation guy. I've always had a, like when people tell me the elevation of a mountain, I just, I nod. Like I know what that means, but I don't really know what elevations mean. No, no I feel like you have to go over a thousand for it to count. Well, this would be well above a thousand if uh, AppalachianTrail.org is leading me in the right direction. <laughs> so, so Ryan, tell us who did you, who'd you talk to? So, so today we're going to talk to uh, Steve Holt and Steve Holt is with the Appalachian Mountain Club, um, which is one of the clubs that's been involved uh, in the Appalachian Trail for many, many years. Um, and he wrote a little piece for Outdoor.org about the hundred year history of the Appalachian trail, which just kicks off this year. This is the anniversary, the big 100. It's all over the place. I'm seeing a a lot of articles out there celebrating the Appalachian trail. I have to say reading these articles, you know, hearing your interview gets me very itchy to get out there and get hiking. Oh no, I agree. I am. I'm so ready for the heat to die a little bit so I can get back out there. You know, you, you and I are not summer hikers. No, we're, no, we're no. very much dead of winter hikers. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, we, we'd be great at that. And also hikers, you know, we go, you know, maybe five miles in a day and then go yeah. out and get a beer. Yeah. Yeah. We're not, uh, we're not a well-earned beer, by the way. Exactly. Maybe, maybe two. Well, you want me to. Now, Ryan, I, uh, on previous episodes, we had talked about uh, that we were both planning trips, both to the Southwest, actually, for the fall. And I'm wondering, because of the Delta variant, are, are, you, are you changing those plans at all? Yeah, I'm going on actually on a, on a road trip. Uh-huh. Um, instead, uh-huh. we're going up to uh, Quebec City, which is, I know, a favorite oh, of yours. And yeah, you got to go back and listen to the episode. And this is a great reason for me to link it in the show notes. Fantastic. And then we're going to go back through Montreal. So you know, maybe do a, an update, you know, 2021 Montreal, Quebec city, uh, addendum episode. Um, but it'll be fun. And, you know, Canada requires your, uh, vaccination uh, along with a negative PCR test. So, um, you know, going up there, it's going to be interesting. Absolutely. You're taking advantage of the fact that the, the borders recently opened that puts us in a very specific, uh, moment in time. Now, are you at all afraid that it could close again? Um, as long as I'm, a, it closes with me inside. <laughs> yeah. Seems <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, yeah. I'm, I am, uh, I'm currently mourning the fact that uh, Catherine and I were planning on taking young Charlie and uh, flying to visit some friends in the Southwest, and we were going to do a national parks road trip out there. But to play it safe, of course, uh, my toddler son not yet able to be vaccinated. We, we too are doing a road trip, and we are going. I, I'm at, I'm really happy to say, you know, we used a lot of the pandemic to explore Maine. And uh, it was about a year ago we did a, a, a week in Maine and we explored a ton and had a great time. This time we're going to the Adirondacks where I, I've never been, um, but I, I've been reading a lot about the history. You know, so many, I, I, you, you would know this very well. 
you love all these old uh, mansions that are along the Hudson. If you keep going up, this is where all the bazillionaires from New York City summered. So there's these beautiful lodges that they built even higher up uh, in the state. And that, that's where we'll be visiting. Oh, I've, I've never been up there. So I'm, I'm jealous to see, uh, to see some, of those, some of those pictures. Are you going to go visit one of these famous lodges? Oh, yeah. We're, we're staying in a couple. I'm very, the one I'm probably most excited about is a, a special tip from, from somebody who, who we know in common. A shout out to Thaddeus. And uh, listener Thaddeus recommended to me, it's called White Pine Camp. And Ryan, what distinguishes it is that none other than President Calvin Coolidge used to summer there. The, the Calvin Coolidge? The, <laughs> yes, the Calvin. Wow. What other Calvin Coolidge would I be saying? Wow. Exactly, the Calvin Coolidge. Wow. And you know, he would probably be a wonderful person to summer with because he'd be so nice yeah. and quiet. We could get him on the show. Well, I mean, it would be a very short interview. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, it's got some presidential history. Uh, you know, I'm told that the, the very bad internet connections, which is exactly what I'm looking for. So we'll be going up there uh, right after Labor Day. And I, I really want to come back and do a great Adirondacks overview episode. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I'm, look coming, I'm looking forward to coming back and, you know, redoing your Quebec City and get everything that you missed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, what, what you can do is you can get past, you know, that was Quebec City 1, so it covered off all the big tourist sites. You can come back and tell us all the hip, smaller stuff. Oh, absolutely. That's, that, that's, that's my style. You do have to listen back, though. There's a really cool, like, arcade bar there. You should definitely stop there. I think it, you'd have a good time. It is a very long drive, and there's nothing Eugene likes more than when I put on old episodes of Out of Office to listen to. <laughs> So I, I think we might be able to get through half the catalog. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Ryan, I, I think it's very important. We, we want to honor, you know, you have a lot of great information coming up. I think we should get to Steve Holt. Yeah. Yeah. Flight attendants. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the cabin crew. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right. I'm here with Steve Holt of the Appalachian Mountain Club. Steve, uh, welcome to Out of Office. Thanks, Ryan. Good to be here. Well, I really appreciate you joining us today to talk about uh, the Appalachian Trail, something that Kieran and I are both big fans of, and how it turns 100 this year. So, you know, for folks who don't know, um, you know, where does the Appalachian Trail run and, and just about how long is, is this trail? Yeah, great question. So um, the Appalachian Trail is um, 2,192 miles long. And um, it runs uh, between Springer Mountain in um, uh, Georgia, the state of Georgia's uh, Chattahoochee National Forest, and um, a mountain in Maine um, called Katahdin. So it goes between Maine and Georgia. So tell me a bit about uh, Benton uh, Mackay and what, he, what exactly did he publish 100 years ago? Right. So... So Benton Mackay was this New England kid who spent times on, time on farms between Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Vermont before finally settling in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, he was really quite curious from an early age about the natural world um, and, and preferred rural life to city life, uh, although he did live in, uh, in D.C. and Boston for a time. Um, he was uh, a Harvard-trained geologist uh, who actually would eventually teach in Harvard's forestry school, beginning kind of in the early aughts, uh, early 1900s. Um, and, but he really rose to prominence um, by working in a number of regional and federal agencies and bureaus as a forester and planner, um, including the Tennessee Valley Authority, the U.S. Forest Service, and the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, so he was, he was really one of the pioneers of the concept of land preservation for, for human recreation. Um, so in, in, in 1921, um, by, by this time, he was quite a prominent, uh, you know, preeminent forester and planner nationally. Uh, Mackay published his vision for a contiguous hiking trail between New England and the American South. Um, and that was published by the Journal of the American Institute of Architects in the October issue, um, which at that time, having that endorsement uh, of that, you know, uh, prominent um, trade 
organization was absolutely invaluable to um, to a vision like Mackay's. So his vision for this for for this trail was to quote establish a base for a more extensive and systematic development of outdoors community life. So he had this very sort of esoteric, um, you know, uh, social vision for for how a trail could sort of knit together the the uh, rural and the urban. Um, so in addition to having the you know his treatise published in the Journal of the American Institute of Architects, he also would get his article published in the New York Times, which really really gave that vision a uh, a boost and got it out there. Um, and he he began to use his his extensive network of um, political connections based based on his experience working in the federal government and in regional government to really push his idea out uh, to the general public and to folks all along the trail. So when we say that this is the 100th anniversary of the Appalachian Trail, it's really the 100th anniversary of the conception of the Appalachian Trail um, by Benton Mackay in, 20, in 1921 um, in the uh, Journal of the American Institute of Architects. So one of the things that really Im- impressed me about uh, the article you wrote for um, Outdoors.org is this is a massive group project. I mean, there are so many people involved in, in making this happen. So uh, Benton is is credited with getting, he publishes his paper. He gets the first conference together of folks who are going to come together and sort of actually, you know, make this idea happen. And that's led by a, a guy named William Welch. Uh, so what is Welch credited with? Yeah, so four years after Mackay's vision was published in 1925, um, the first Appalachian Trail Conference was called, um, and they had an objective of uh, organizing a body of workers representative of the outdoor living and of the regions adjacent to the Appalachian Range to complete the building of the Appalachian Trail. So um, this was sort of the first the opening salvo of uh, getting this thing, um, getting this thing done, of fulfilling the the vision of Mackay, and he was a he was an early leader in the Appalachian Trail Conference. Um, but Major William A. Welch was uh, was the ina- inaugural chair of the conference. Um, so Welch had been um, instrumental in forming the New York uh, State Park System, um, and um, I believe was was at at the helm at the Palisades Interstate Park, which is one of the first, uh, one of the oldest um, state parks in the country. And also, um, um, he, he also was involved in Bear Mountain, which is an amazing uh, state hmm. park, and uh, Harriman State Park in New Jersey, which um, I'm a big fan of since I I live in New York. I, I've gone to that one quite a bit. So this guy, th- this guy knew he he knew land preservation. Yes, he yes he did yes he did and we we love Harriman too at AMC because we have a, a wonderful outdoor center down there um, as well thirty minutes outside of Manhattan um, yeah so Welch uh, Welch was a uh, a good first leader of this uh, of this movement had a lot of experience coming into um, coming into this process and um, he you know of course later on years later he would be credited with both making the uh, designing and creating the first eight uh, Appalachian Trail markers, um, and uh, and actually may have even come up with the slogan "Maine to Georgia," which is a um, kind of a, a moniker of the uh, the AT um, as well. So yeah, William, or William Welch was was really um, was really vital in this whole process. And as I'm reading about these these characters, this one jumped out at me, Myron Avery. Now, Myron Avery mm-hmm. seems to me sort of like a like a professorial, uh, like a uh, Indiana Jones kind of character in a way. Can you tell tell us a bit about him? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so Avery was this young Connecticut guy, um, Harvard Law School graduate. Um, he never he never to my knowledge, actually became a practicing lawyer. Um, I'm not sure if he took the bar uh, even, but he was really like the rocket fuel that, that sort of helped the trail build, uh, building process and the advocacy to sort of take off. So the guy that was leading the, uh, the um, Appalachian Trail uh, conference at the, at the time after Welch was, um, 
was a guy named Arthur Perkins, who was a, a retired lawyer and police court judge, and also a, a chapter uh, officer with the uh, with Appalachian Mountain Club um, in Connecticut. And um, and Perkins had you know uh, done quite a bit to move the process forward. They they updated their mission and things to promote us and establish and maintain a continuous trail for walkers with a system of shelters and other necessary equipment as a means for stimulating public interest in the pro protection, conservation, and best use of the natural resources within the mountains and wilderness areas of the East, unquote. So that is, end quote. So that is the, um, that, you know, they, they brought environmental stewardship uh, into the, this process from those early days, but they, they really lacked that, uh, that person that, um, like you said, that Indiana Jones figure who could take this to the next level. So uh, Avery, uh, Myron Avery, and this little group of uh, Washington, D.C. Um, outdoors people uh, that had formed, um, they'd actually formed a Potomac Appalachian Trail Club down in the D.C. area and um, got onto the radar of the Appalachian Trail uh, Conference and they actually began blazing routes uh, for the Appalachian Trail in West Virginia, uh, in Northern Virginia. And, and really for a number of years, that group, that small group headed up by, uh, by Avery, uh, took on much of the field work um, of the Appalachian Trail, doing, you know, plotting routes, organizing other clubs to do trail work, uh, recruiting volunteers, and, and basically ultimately like cutting, blazing, and printing guidebooks for, for a, a long stretch of the uh, Appalachian Trail. And actually, Avery himself would, would blaze and map um, most of the AT in the mid-Atlantic by himself um, uh, in the 1930s um, and, and is really believed to be one of the first to, to hike the entire uh, Appalachian Trail. Of course, he was sort of doing it uh, for, for, uh, for his job, uh, as opposed to, you know, taking a few months off uh, from your, you know, from your office job to, to take, uh, to, to go on the AT. But he, um, so he did that. And then he would eventually be elected um, in 1937 uh, to seven consecutive terms as the chair of the um, Appalachian Trail Conference. So this was a really important figure in the, uh, in the genesis of the Appalachian Trail. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, that's a that's a Netflix movie waiting to happen, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so um, th th you mentioned all these local groups that got involved. Can you talk a little bit more about how they organized? You know, I was pretty impressed with, you know, um, it looks like a, you know, a lot of women were also involved in this. And you just tell tell us a bit about like who these folks were who kind of made this happen mm -hmm. on a local level. Yeah, so the AT doesn't get built, um, nor does it survive for a century without the contributions of local and regional trail clubs and groups, many of them volunteers, um, men and women, uh, as you said. Um, so near the, near the end of the, just backing up a little bit from the AT, so near, near the end of the 19th century, there was this national conversation um, and movement around land conservation. So this was sort of the beginning of the, co uh, the process that would eventually end in the formation of our, our you know, national parks um, and, of course, the Appalachian Trail um, to protect, you know, basically to protect these American lands that had sprung up. Um, and with it, the creation of all these environmental and recreational groups. Um, so you had groups like the Sierra Club, um, but also uh, our, our, my group, the, uh, my club, the Appalachian Mountain Club uh, in Boston, which formed, with, you know, with an interest in conserving outdoor spaces in the Northeast and getting people out of cities for group hikes and such. Um, so there were, and then there were other smaller outdoor clubs as well, um, you know, that were more, more regional, um, you know, across Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine and down into the Mid-Atlantic, like uh, like Avery's Club. Um, so AMC at this point, by the time the you know by the time the AT was was conceived, um, the you know AMC was already um, the primary steward of hiking trails in New England, um, and they'd already formed the country's first paid 
uh, professional trail crew in 1919. Um, and so these young men, um, it was young men at that time for AMC, uh, that is different now. Um, but these young men were already cutting and maintaining trails in the White Mountains and Maine um, by the time the, uh, the AT rolls around. And so they were ready when, when the call came for them to uh, kind of connect these networks of trails um, um, between, the, uh, between the Northeast and the South. And tell me a bit about the Civilian um, Conservation Corps that, that FDR started. How, how did they help? Yeah, absolutely. FDR was, you know, the, the, the New Deal was, was sort of his landmark legislation um, passed in 1933. And the, the Civilian Conservation Corps was, um, was part of that. Um, it was really, it was a work relief program that gave millions of young men employment on environmental uh, projects throughout the Great Depression. Um, so it served both sort of an environmental and a jobs creation uh, objective. Sounds a bit um, like the Green New Deal to me, Steve. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's right. A lot of, a lot of people make that, um, make that comparison and it is, uh, it's a good one. Uh, it, there's a good case to be made for, uh, for uh, the recreation of something like this today. Um, but, but, you know, this was really interesting when I read that by July 1st of 1933, so just a few months after the, um, uh, this legislation had been passed, um, or the, the Con Civilian Conservation Corps had been created, um, there were already uh, over 1,400 working camps that had been established uh, and more than 300,000 men uh, put to work across the country. Um, and it, this is believed to be the most rapid peaceful, or, sorry, peacetime mobilization in American history. Um, it, so under the guidance of the U.S. Forest Service and uh, the National Park Service and the Department of Interior and Agriculture, um, um, Civilian Conservation Corps employees, they fought forest fires, planted trees, cleared and maintained access roads, reseeded grazing lands, and implementing so implemented soil erosion uh, controls. Um, and really, the CCC provided the elbow grease uh, needed to kind of get the construction of the Appalachian Trail over the finish line. Uh, it, it was a remarkable program, and I don't, um, you know, in addition to these volunteer groups that uh, from across the region that uh, pitched in, I, I don't know that it, this gets done without the CCC. So construction seems to have really sped up because by 1928, there were about 500 miles of trails. Now, wh when do we see the full trail, the 2000 plus, when do we see that completed? Yeah, so the full trail um, would not be uh, completely connected until 1937. So the war, the World War II starts getting going and, you know, a lot of folks go off to war. A lot of other people have to go and work in, in factories to make sure they have equipment and food, et cetera. And the trail seems to fall into a state of disrepair. Can you can you talk a bit about that period and, and what saw the resurgence of the of the trail? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so like a lot of industries, uh, um, you know, nearly all the able bodied men um, were called away to serve in World War Two. Um, and so because of the lack of, um, uh, because of the lack of trail maintenance, um, many sections of the AT, uh, fell into disarray, um, during the 1940s, as you say. And then, so after the war, you know, groups really set out in earnest to get the trail back to its original glory. Um, and it really hadn't been, um, completed for very long at the time that, that it began to fall into disrepair. Um, and so then in 1951, uh, you know, led by Myron Avery himself, just a year before his death, um, they have a reopening ceremony for the trail and just invite people back to the trail to try it, uh, you know, to, to hike it. Um, and, and, and that a year later, uh, in 1952, um, Mildred Norman becomes the first woman to through hike the entire trail in a single season. Um, the, the first man to report doing it had done it a few years earlier, a guy named Earl Schaffer. 
1948. And, and Mil- um, Mildred, Mildred Norman seems like quite a character. Uh, she later on in life becomes a, a mystic uh, who goes by the name of Peace Pilgrim. So uh, yeah. she, se- she seems like a, totally somebody who, the kind of person who would be the first to walk the trail, you know? That's right. Yeah, yeah. she was a character uh, for sure. Um, but, you know, but it took a few years after the war to, to really get the, the trail into, into an operable state uh, again. Um, and it was just in time because, um, you know, the 1960s would begin um, a decades long uh, hiking boom that would bring just untold numbers of people to the uh, to the Appalachian Trail. So folks start hiking a lot in the 60s. You know, uh, fast forward to, to where we are now, like how many people are walking the trail? I mean, last year, I know I did more hiking last year during the pandemic right. um, than I have in my entire life combined. So is that something you're seeing in the, in the numbers of more folks out there? Yeah, more folks are out there um, for sure. Um, and and that is playing out on the uh, Appalachian Trail as well. So the Appalachian Trail was closed uh, for much of the season in 2020. Um, uh, hundreds of hikers um, had to leave the trail when the uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic began. Um, you know, hard to it's a hard thing to enforce, uh, but they did ask people to to leave the trail, and a bunch of people did not did not finish their journey. So this year, um, the, the ATC counts up, they ask people to register every year. Uh, if you're, if they're planning on going, uh, you know, jumping on the trail to try to do a, a through hike, which is a, a single season hike of the entire, uh, you know, 2100, uh, mile route. Um, and they had nearly 4,000, uh, people counted as having that as, as jumping, you know, as doing this, this through hike this year um, alone. Um, and those are just the people that, um, that, they, that they were able to count. There's many more that are, um, you know, they, they don't register. Um, what's, what's the sort of average uh, time it takes somebody to, to do that walk? Yeah, the average, the average time is about five to seven months to hike the entire right. Appalachian Trail. So um, that usually, you know, involves like leaving Georgia, and, and the idea is, that you, you know, people hike it in both directions. Uh, more people hike it south to north um, because it it just works out um, from a climate perspective. Um, you can start in, you know, when it's cooler in Georgia and, um, you know, in March or so and start hiking north and, um, you know, uh, so you skip the, uh, you know, you, you get out of the sort of um, oppressive heat in the south and come into more kind of seasonable summer uh, in the northeast um, in the later parts of the, you know, of the summer. So uh, typically five to seven months. It's on my bucket list. You know, it's it's it, I, I've, I've definitely hiked parts of it um, yeah. and it's it's so beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. I, I wonder what are your. You know, I'm a, I'm a sort of Delaware Water Gap uh, uh, kind of guy. Mm-hmm. But what 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 is your favorite uh, place to hike in the in the trail? Yeah, and I'll just say as an aside too, uh, I don't want to I don't want to skip over the fact that you know many many tens of thousands of other people hike on the AT each year uh, just for an afternoon or a day or a weekend. You know, there uh, those people are Appalachian Trail hikers as well. Uh, there are you know through hikers are a special breed. Um, for sure, but I, the majority of the use of the of the Appalachian Trail is is by folks doing it for uh, you know a couple of hours or a couple of days uh, here or there. So and you can uh, use a, would, you can use an app like you know All Trails, and you can you know you can hike it in sections. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right, that's right. And we've actually got um, a couple of stories coming out um, uh, at outdoors.org here in the next few um, the next month or so. Um, by folks that during the pandemic uh, hiked the uh, Appalachian Trail in their state. Um, you know, the entire, they section hiked it. So they did, uh, you know, they took five or six or seven days and uh, over the course of a couple of months and did, uh, and section hiked it. Um, so it's, it's quite possible. Of course, Connecticut is like a very, you know, it's, 
it's about 48 to 50 miles of trail. So it's quite doable in a couple of, a uh, couple of days to just do the AT in your, in your state, if you live in say Connecticut or Massachusetts. But to answer your question about my favorite place to, um, on the trail to hike, I, I absolutely love the presidential range in, in New Hampshire's White Mountains. Um, I, I I'll, you know, just to be honest, I haven't um, hiked uh, many other stretches of the uh, Appalachian Trail um, in, other, in other parts of the region, but I love the White Mountains. Um, so a couple of years ago uh, with some friends, uh, a couple of guys uh, that are neighbors of mine, we, we actually trail ran the length of that the presidential range, which is about 20 miles. Um, and that largely follows the Appalachian trail. And it was so beautiful and difficult. Um, you know, Northeast mountains are, are super rocky and rooty. Uh, and most of the trails, you know, unlike trails out West, uh, which feature lots of switchbacks to kind of give your legs a rest and sort of, um, you know, they level out the, uh, the trail a little more. Most of the trails here in the East, uh, they just cut them straight up the mountain from the base to the summit. Um, so, so they're, they're quite, it's quite kind of notoriously difficult, but once you're up there above the tree line, the reason I love the, the presidentials is once you're up there above the tree line, just kind of running or hiking along the, that ridge line, um, you, you just have this amazing, um, realization that you're at the highest point, uh, for thousands of miles and, uh, I mean, it's like it's like being on another planet. It, it really is otherworldly up there. Well, look, a couple uh, before we get into Appalachian Mountain Club, I'm just curious. What are some of the other groups that are responsible for keeping the trail beautiful today? Yeah. So um, you remember in the beginning, we talked about the Appalachian Trail Conference, um, which which really kicked off the um, kicked off the uh, building of the Appalachian Trail. So that that organization is still in existence. It's now now called the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, um, and they are the lead steward and you know an advocate of the Appalachian Trail. Um, and so um, they, I would be remiss to to, to not uh, mention the ATC, which is uh, which is the uh, preeminent, um, you know, guardian of the Appalachian trail. Um, they, they got, uh, so, so for the Appalachian trail to become a, uh, national scenic trail, the federal government actually had to go in and purchase the land around all 2,190 miles of the, uh, of the trail. Um, and they started that in the, uh, in, I believe 1971, and they, they just con, con, concluded that they, they purchased the last, the federal government purchased the last, um, the last parcel of that land in 2014. So it took them like the uh, 40 something years to, to do that. And the Appalachian Trail Conservancy led that, uh, led that push, um, for, for almost the entire way. Um, but there are 30 other trail clubs that, um, uh, you know, along the trail that perform the lion's share of the uh, regular maintenance on the trail, uh, like clearing blown down trees in the spring and, you know, building drainage systems, um, repairing the huts and shelters along the way for the hikers and, and the like. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, Appalachian Mountain Club's fingerprints were on the trail uh, at its genesis, and um, we've we've helped maintain the trail ever since um and we're actually we're actually the uh we actually maintain more miles to the at than than any other uh single organization um and most of that is is done by the the individual chapters um along the trail in the north Atl northeast and the mid-atlantic um who hike you know who who hike those local at miles and they also uh they also help uh keep them uh in a condition that, that makes it, make them hikeable. Well, uh, so tell us a bit more about the Appalachian mountain club, your organization and your mission and how folks can find all the, you know, the fantastic stuff you're writing about, about, you know, things like this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I just want to say thanks again for, for having us on. Um, the, the experts on the Appalachian Trail are really the folks at the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, the people um, at the, uh, the Rahner Libra Library uh, at Dartmouth College, which uh, has uh, Benton Mackay's um, papers. Um, and they were, they were truly uh, instrumental in, um, in pull, helping me pull together the, uh, the research for the photo essay uh, that, uh, that I helped write. So, um, but yeah, AMC, we are a chapter-based organization um, that fosters the protection, enjoyment, and understanding of the outdoors. Um, so we have around 70,000 members, um, and our chapters are in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast. Um, so think, um, Virginia up to, uh, New York and Maine. Um, so we're, we're coming up on our 150th anniversary, uh, since our founding, uh, in 1876. And, um, you know, the mission of protecting, enjoying, and understanding the outdoors is, uh, it's never been more important now, given the, the challenges to land conservation in recent years from overdevelopment, um, fossil fuel drilling. Uh, and the like. Um, and we've also turned our focus in recent decades to the climate crisis. Um, you know, even today as we're taping uh, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a, a report showing that global warming has outpaced expectations and humans need to curb emissions now before it's too late. Um, and AMC has been monitoring air quality in the, in the mountains for decades. And, you know, we're now advocating for policies around energy and transportation to lower greenhouse gas emissions and slow the impact of climate change um, on which action is more crucial than ever. So, you know, climate, the other thing to mention too is that climate change is impacting that core mission, which is um, the outdoor recreation. Um, you know, shorter, warmer, less snowy winters, for instance, um, those, that affects the ski season. Um, you know, more frequent and powerful storms in the summer, spring and summer, um, you know, that destroys forests and washes out trails. So, so it's really a, uh, this is, this also serves, you know, our work in the climate, um, crisis also serves a, um, a role in protecting our work, uh, in outdoor recreation. Um, and that really is our bread and butter is getting people outside wherever they are however they're able. Um, and, you know, a recent focus of ours has just been the fact that outdoor spaces are, you know, they're frequently not, um, they have not been as accessible or welcoming to people of all races and backgrounds. Um, and there's a, there's a lot, there's a complex history there. And there's, we, we've written recently on our website um, about that. And maybe we can put that in the show notes as well. But um, AMC is working hard to increase access for, for all communities um, and reflect the diversity in the communities that we serve um, and also reflect the, the, the diversity in the ways in which people get outdoors. You know, you don't have to run up Mount Washington to enjoy the wonder of the outdoors. You know, sometimes it's as simple as stepping into your backyard or your local park. Um, the best place to get involved, um, you know, if people are, are so uh, inclined uh, with AMC is to visit outdoors.org. Um, you know, there you can read hundreds of articles about how to be outdoors safely, uh, you know, adventure narratives and um, stories about our conservation work and the conservation work of others and plug into the, the work that, you know, your local chapters are doing. Um, so if you live in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic, as you mentioned, um, you know, you have an AMC chapter near you that is organizing hikes and rides, nature walks, social events, and even helping to maintain local trails like the Appalachian Trail. So it's outdoors.org if uh, folks want to uh, get plugged in, donate, um, you know, help protect this wonderful trail that we have for another 100, 200, 300 years. Well, thanks again to Steve Holt of the Appalachian Mountain Club. Uh, we'll put all those links in the show notes. And now I think it's time for the last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. 
All right, Ryan, we're, we're here in the last stop. This is the last segment of the show, the final segment. It's my favorite segment. It's your favorite segment. It's popularly known as the people segment. And it's, uh, it's a moment of meditation. It's a moment of sharing and giving, receiving and appreciating. Uh, and it's because you and I each, but we prepare, uh, you know, a lot of people think that we're just making this up on the go. In fact, every pause, every, every beat is well scripted. And we have each prepared one thing. It could, it could be anything. That's what, that's what makes the last stop so fun. It can be a piece of gear. It can be a story. It can be a memory. It can be a reflection. It could be a novel, it could be an article, anything that fed the spirit of wanderlust within us, even during the work a day week. And I was so inspired by your interview with Steve Halt that I thought what might be fun is why don't we each share one hike that we've done, which is one small sliver of the great Appalachian Trail. Totally. So like, you know, I, I mentioned to Steve, you could you could download all trails and you could just mark each little section of the of the Appalachian Trail and get all 2000 in. And it's in many little chunks as you want. So I like to think that's how I've started that, even though I have, I've, I've only walked. Probably. Cause you're averaging about one a year. So I think I've done two, maybe in, three total. So, so that means in 2,100 years, you're, you're going to be one of the, the people who can claim you did the Appalachian trail. He suggested you start with like a small state like Connecticut, right? He says Connecticut's the perfect state to have walked the entire trail. You can do it in like two days. <laughs> Well, I, my, my last stop is going to be a Connecticut piece of the trail. So let's not jump ahead. Uh, oh, oh, well then I now, won't. Now, before you say your segment though, I'm wondering, do you have any, like if somebody was walking around saying they did the Appalachian trail and then you, you asked a couple of follow-up questions and you discovered, well, they didn't walk the whole thing in five to seven months. What they actually did was, you know, over 25 years, they did segments of it. What, would you, would you judge that person? You know, Steve made a point that everybody, you know, everyone's an Appalachian Trail walker, whether you walk just, you know, a couple hours with your yeah, dog, or, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah but, yeah. but of course, you know, yeah, I, mean, I mean, you know me, a, I'm a, a real, I'm a, I'm a yeah, box no. checker. Yeah, no, I, it, I, I told him that you and I are going to do this. We're, we're going <laughs> to, oh, <laughs> I this is going to be to that all next season. Just <laughs> you and I trekking through the live and the Appalachian Trail. Um, yeah, I think it'll be, it, it'll be an interesting second season. Uh, yeah, that's going to be very boring. Anyone who's read a walk in the woods by Bill Bryson already knows how it ends, which is after a few days, you and I go, eh, you know, it, it's all, it's just trees, trees and hills. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we can write, I, 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 I think you'd write a beautiful hiking travel narrative that, right, I, that, that I would put my name on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, now, now share what piece of the Appalachian Trail uh, have you brought as your last stop? Well, uh, during quarantine, got to hike the Delaware Water Gap, um, which is right on the border of New Jersey and Pennsylvania where the Delaware River sort of cuts through mm. the Appalachian Mountains. And, and you can uh, walk a bit of the trail. There's a bunch of trails there. You can walk a bit of the Appalachian Trail and you get a beautiful view of the Water Gap. Um, and it, it was, it was, it, it was a, one of the more you know, one of the more out of the way hikes, like once you get past like the, you know, the people who are sort of walking very, very inland, once you get like a mile or two out, you, you really are on, on your own out there. So it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And um, yeah, I definitely made me want to get back to the Delaware Water Gap. And uh, what, what time of year did you go? We went in like the, gosh, it would have been like April, May, May of that, of, you know, of 2020, mm. you know, mm -hmm. when, when, when there wasn't any outdoor, acti or any indoor activities going on at all. So we did a lot of hiking then. Yeah. So that, so the reason I asked uh, about the season was because uh, the season really uh, locks in my memory of the trail that, I, that I'm going to share, which is uh, it's called Bear Mountain in Connecticut. So it's a piece of the Appalachian Trail uh, the, the full hike is Bear Mountain to Racebrook Falls. And you actually cross from Connecticut into Massachusetts in doing that. And uh, it was a great Catherine uh, at that time lived in New Haven. And so I was uh, out from New York City visiting. And uh, we said, you know, it's it's November. It's, it's sort of cool out and crisp, but it was past the peak foliage time, right? So you didn't have all the leaf peepers like clogging up the trail. And so we did some research and we drove... Uh, up to the northwest corner of Connecticut, which that's, uh, it, it's got, uh, it, it's a super bucolic, lovely farmland area. Like, I don't think, 
I think people don't think of Connecticut as like a rural place, but this is actually a quite rural area. And uh, you hit a state park and you, you head off onto Bear Mountain and you get some awesome views all around. And I, I really like that moody time of year. You know, it's not quite Thanksgiving yet, but you don't have the beautiful reds and oranges. Everything's kind of settling into a nice winter brown. That, 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 that's where I like to be. And this hike really sticks in the memory for that. I, you know, I have not done that much hiking in Connecticut. So, so, I mean, I will do this when I do my con- through Connecticut, uh, Appalachian trail, I, <laughs> those two days that you're going to commit to. I'm, I'm, I, 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 by this time next year, if I haven't walked Connecticut, you can call me out on it. I mean, it's a shame that, uh, it doesn't go through Rhode Island. You think Rhode Island, you could probably get, you know, through the Appalachian <laughs> trail in like a couple in an hour or two. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, they didn't even have any space. So. And joking aside, is there any part of you that like really would like to do the full Appalachian trail there? I would say there's a small part of me that, Mm. that, that could imagine doing it. Yeah. I think it's like this. I I think it's the same part of me that admires people who do marathons where I'm like, that's a cool thing to be able to claim. It's a cool thing to have done, but it's not a cool thing for me to do. Walking the full Appalachian trail is cooler than a marathon though. Right. I mean, no, you know, it's a much bigger commitment for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, now I, the marathon running isn't amazing. And, 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 uh, you know, I mean, I think ex- the bad inspiring. value of it is very cool. Um, but uh, the, you know, the Bill Bryson book really did make me think I could see where it would get, you know, you get two months into the seventh month trek and you kind of go a lot of, a lot of trees in this country. Yeah, no, that that's, uh, there are definitely a lot of trees in this country. And that's one of the things you probably discover if you walk the trail. Well, uh, maybe, maybe, to get, maybe I'll do half and you could do half. How's that? I, I think that sounds good. I, you know, Kieran, you must be inspired by all the, all the Harvard men um, who helped build that trail though. Uh, why, why would that inspire me? Well, you yourself are a Harvard man. Oh, I, you know, I don't like to say it, but now that you've said it, uh, yes, of course that, that registered with me. And I, I think it's a, it's very true to our, our hearty nature that, that Harvard graduates are known for, <laughs> for cutting down trees and, 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 and you know, pay, making trails. Oh, you gotta, you gotta clear the path, clear the path, <laughs> clear the path of all those Yaleys. Am I right? <laughs> exactly. What are we talking about on the, uh, the next episode? So, Ryan, as I happened to mention earlier, uh, over the past uh, year, but even before that, uh, Catherine and I have become huge fans of our neighbor to the north, Maine, also known as Vacation Land. And, uh, you know, we're, we're you know, you know, the phrase promises made, promises kept. Yeah, I've heard it. Listen, and I, I coined it. I don't know if you know that. In, in episode 100, you and I made a promise about all the different episodes that we were going to bring in, in the next 100. And one of those was one of our patented city guides. And you and I are going to talk about Portland, Maine, which I understand you're, you're actually going to next week. Yeah, I'm going to be in Portland, Maine. So maybe I'll have, uh, you know, I'll find some gem that you didn't get to discover. I, I, I was pretty thorough, but I, I'll, I'll send you a couple of things that I want you to check out. And then we <laughs> can discuss do. and debate it on the episode. So a guide to Portland, Maine. Well, until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. Is he taken? I'm just imagining you chopping down the trees and, you know, <laughs> blazing, blazing the trail. While, uh, very exciting. I it's like sort of, to think of yeah. myself as a trailblazer. It's very Indiana Jones characters. <laughs>